The Magic Show is brought to you by StarCityGames.com, and check this out. On Saturday, October 25th, the Star City Games $5,000 Standard Open returns to Richmond, Virginia, and this event is going to be huge. Hundreds of players, Friday Night Trials, the $5,000 Standard Open, a Pro Tour Kyoto Qualifier, tons of side events, and more will make for a magical weekend you won't soon forget. So make plans to join us in Richmond, and we'll see you there. In order to see if DJ was up to the task of replacing Nassif, we had them play a game. DJ's mold to four, and he's on the play. So let's see how he, this game turns out. I'll keep. Keep. Okay. Yep. This is probably right. <laughs> right up on him? <laughs> sure. Right up on him? Okay. Right. <laughs> Are you serious? I think it's the right play right now. Are you okay? I'm at twenty. Storm count is at three. Yep. <laughs> oh, Whatever. No, no, no. Thirteen. Cool. Gotta shuffle every time. It's all good. No, I swear. Cool to me, it's very good. That's one more? No, I swear. It's very, very good. Last copy. And you gotta slam it. Just flip it. No peeking. Everybody and welcome to another edition of the Magic Show. This week we're getting you prepared for two big tournaments at the same time. For those preparing for next week's huge 5K tournament in Richmond, Virginia, we'll have interviews with the top two cruise qualifier finishers and complete deck techs from both. For those headed to Kansas City like me this weekend, we got another even more in-depth sealed breakdown from Patrick Chapin and friends. Let's go. <laughs> So I'm here with Chris Walterek, who just made top two. We're about to play the final match. And so uh, tell me what you played today and why. Well, I played the uh, five color control deck, mm -hmm. mostly based off uh, Pat Chapin's list. Mm -hmm. um, and so how did we come to, uh, to these exact numbers? And things? Well, I originally was playing a five color deck that Gary Thompson made, and it was more of a anti-creature based deck with story circles and whatnot mm -hmm. but I was concerned about the mirror match so I uh, decided to uh, change everything up a little bit and I'm playing a bunch of negates now um, next to our mind shatter main yeah the mind shatter has been really awesome today hasn't it? yeah just that's that's basically what cruel ultimatum is it's like a mind shatter for three Mind Shatter is definitely worth playing. And so tell me why so, sort of the random quote unquote one of Well, what they do for you. Well, the Mind Shatter allows me to have a game one plan versus uh, any any like creature based deck or something uh, removal heavy deck that holds their cards and removal. And then, because there's very few ways to actually kill someone. So you, they normally, if they get like a bunch of Wrath, Oblivion Rings or something, you can just strip them and then start start over from there. Fire Spout's just basically a fifth Wrath. The Knuckle V is, is kind of needed. If you draw it late game, you can just get a Cryptic Lock. And I actually wanted to play two mannequins, and I can only find room for the one. <laughs> and so, uh, how's it been playing today? How would, how's your matchups been? Uh, pretty good. I've played pretty much everything yeah. today. Um, fairies, Merfolk, Demigod, uh, Revlark. Revlark. Um, rock, fairies, so that's why it's a good deck because it's consistent versus everything. I, I lost the two games to Revlark and that was it. Wow. And so the, the sort of accepted acumen is that this is the best deck. Yeah, it's got to be the best deck. You can put anything you want in it and it's got Cryptic Command, Mold Drifter, and Wrath of God so good now. 
Wow. So I, I think it's the best deck, most consistent for any tournament more than six rounds. Let's talk about the cyborg. Tell me about why these cards are in the cyborg and what matchups they pertain to. All right. Well, uh, additional Fire Spout, Mind Shatter, Shriek Maw, um, Aggro, and then Control Base decks. The Una is there to add the extra win condition. Uh, Cloud Threshers versus the Fairies. And this Counterbore, actually, <clears throat> it works okay. It's basically there versus Revlark, which is a pretty bad matchup. Um, I've only got to play the Revlark deck twice, so I don't know. It has been kind of unimpressive, but it's all right. Um, the Condemn's really good versus cards like Chameleon Colossus and Demigod, which is also why Bant Charm is good, so it kind of shored that up. And the Shushers are actually for the Fairies and the Mirrors, and I've just been bringing them in as Grizzly Bears, Bear Finks. I would have put one uh, Glen Alondra Archmage in the deck had I thought about it maybe a little bit more. I think I would just like one in the sideboard somewhere. Yeah. Would there, are there any other changes you would recommend making to the main deck or the sideboard? <clears throat> Uh, I would probably take the counter boards out and maybe I haven't really tested the uh, the artifact but the artifact might actually work a little bit better because it's not as mana intensive and you can just kind of go and take it each turn the one that claws out the Phyrexian Furnace one. Oh, the uh, Relic of Progenitus? Yeah, because most of the time in the sideboard I take out uh, the Knuckle V anyway so I only have one mana can target so I actually don't use the graveyard at all. So um, you know that you're, you're about to, to play top two, you're about to play fairies. Mm -hmm. What is your game plan? Uh, my game plan is probably going to be pretty much the same game plan I've had for five color versus fairies for the last six months. <laughs> I'm bringing my shushers, my spouts, my threshers, negate, and fight it out. But with the bant charms, it kind of helps a lot. What do you think about game one? Uh, I like game one. I, it's hard to beat this deck, so. Absolutely. All right, so I'm here with? Tim Furrow. Hi, Tim. So tell me, uh, what are you playing today and why? I'm playing Fairies because I know they have a pretty good matchup against the five color control decks. Okay. And I know they have game against the, all the like, Kithkin and Aggro decks. Oh, yeah? So there's some changes here based on Shards of Alar. Can you tell me about them? Well, I wanted some edge in the, uh, in the mirror or in the uh, five color decks with mm -hmm. Esper Charm being white, I had to splash in all the white cards. Okay. And I wanted to be able to draw some cards. That's why Esper Charm is in there. And the sideboard gives me a few more options. Well, there's also Agony Warp. How's that been playing for you? Well, Agony Warp is pretty much like a nameless, but with more options. Mm -hmm. And I like how it just, I like versatility when it comes to playing fairies. So what do you think about the loss of Rune Snag? It's pretty rough. Like Broken Ambition is a substitution, I guess, but I just like I just Rune Snag's just so good. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, so let's talk about your sideboard a little bit. What's in here and for what matches do they pertain to? Well the uh Glen Elgin Arc Mage and Thoughtseize. Okay. Those are mainly for the control decks. And the Oblivion Rings Terrors and Sowers are for the different aggressive decks. Okay. So what did you play today? Can you tell me about any of those matchups? Um, I played against mainly five color control, but I played against a few Kithkin as well. And pretty much the Kithkin beat me because they're just aggressive and I beat five color control every time. Absolutely, including yours truly. Yeah. Which was fun. Close uh, game, too. It was very close. All right, so so tell me, um, what changes would you make if you had any to make? Well, I think the list right now is fairly solid, but it always depends on the metagame at the time. I wouldn't make any changes at all when it comes to the deck. So you're going into top two here for the cruise qualifier against yeah. five color control. So what do you think about your chances? I've got a pretty good chance, but Chris Waltrek is Chris Waltrek. <laughs> In game one, Chris Waltrek wins the roll and mulligans the following hand. Two Vivid Grove, Two Island, A Cruel Ultimatum, Wrath of God, and Moldrifter. After mulliganing, he keeps the following hand. Two Vivid Creek, A Mystic Gate, Wrath of God, A Moldrifter, and Reflecting Pool. Tim Furrow keeps his opener of Island, 
Two Broken Ambitions, A Reflecting Pool, Esper Charm, Bitter Blossom, and Spell Stutter Sprite. Chris leads off with a vivid creek while Tim plays an island and passes. They play lands for another turn until Chris tries to resolve a mole drifter. Tim plays Broken Ambitions, countering the card drawer. They clash as Chris reveals Kitchen Finks and Tim reveals Cryptic Command. Chris keeps the Kitchen Finks on top and puts it, along with Cruel Ultimatum, another Kitchen Finks, Bant Charm, and another Cruel Ultimatum in his graveyard. Tim draws a card and passes the turn. Chris plays another Vivid Creek while Tim plays Spell Stutter Sprite at the end of his turn. Tim then attacks Chris down to 19. Chris plays Kitchen Finks, going up to 21, while Tim plays another Spell Stutter Sprite at the end of Chris's turn. Tim attacks Chris to 19 again and plays Bitter Blossom. Chris has the negate for it, and Tim passes the turn. Chris attacks Tim down to 17 and pays full price for a Shriek Maw to kill a Spell Stutter Sprite. Tim simply attacks Chris to 18 and passes. On Chris's upkeep, Tim plays Mistbind Click, tapping Chris's lands. Chris attacks with Shriek Maw, taking Tim down to 14. Tim then swings with Mistbind Click, bringing Chris to 14. On Chris's next draw step, Tim plays Vendillion Click, revealing Chris's Negate, Wrath of God, and an Island. Tim chooses Wrath of God to put on the bottom of Chris's library. Chris then attacks Tim to 8 life. Tim then swings and takes Chris to just 7 life. Chris goes to his attack step and Tim plays Cryptic Command to tap Chris's creatures and draw a card until Chris negates it. After attacking, Tim is just at 2 life. Chris then plays a Muldrifter to draw both cards and block, then passes the turn. Tim untaps, plays Cryptic Command to tap Chris's creatures and draw a card, and Chris scoops them up. For their Game 2 sideboarding, Chris takes out four Agony Warp, a Loxodon Warhammer, and a single Scion of Una, and puts in two Glenalindra Archmage and four Thoughtseize. Meanwhile, Chris takes out a Vivid Marsh, two Cruel Ultimatum, a Nuclevy, one Bant Charm, a Shriek Maw, and two Wrath of God. He puts in two Cloud Thresher, two Negate, two Jace Bellerin, a Fire Spout, and a Mind Shatter. Chris is on the play in this game. Chris keeps a hand of Cryptic Command, Bant Charm, Vivid Creek, Cascade Bluffs, Mold Drifter, Vexing Shusher, and Mind Shatter. Tim keeps a hand of Thought Seas, Island, Bitter Blossom, Two Reflecting Pool, Fairy Conclave, and Arcane Sanctum. Chris plays Vivid Creek and passes, while Tim plays Fairy Conclave. Chris then runs out Vexing Shusher from his Cascade Bluffs, putting him on the offensive. Tim, meanwhile, plays Sunken Ruins and Bitter Blossom. Chris attacks Tim to 18 and plays a Vivid Meadow. Tim goes to 17 from Bitter Blossom and plays Reflecting Pool, then Thought Seize, taking him down to 15. Chris shows him Bant Charm, Mind Shatter, Mull Drifter, Cryptic Command, and Cloud Thresher. Tim thinks for a moment before choosing Cloud Thresher. Chris, meanwhile, untaps, evokes Mull Drifter, and attacks Tim down to 13. Tim goes to 12 from Bitter Blossom, attacks Chris to 19, plays Fairy Conclave, and passes. Chris attacks Tim with no blocks as Tim goes to 10. Tim goes down to 9 from Bitter Blossom, attacks Chris to 17, then passes. Chris attacks with his Vexing Shusher, which is chump blocked by a fairy token. Tim goes to 8 and attacks Chris down to 15 life. At the end of Tim's turn, Chris Bant charms an untapped token, floating a red from Cascade Bluffs. After it resolves, Chris takes a point of mana burn going to 14. On Chris's turn, he attacks and Tim activates Fairy Conclave in an attempt to block. Chris plays Bant Charm with a red mana floating. Tim plays Broken Ambitions targeting the Bant Charm and Chris activates Vexing Shusher in response targeting the Bant Charm. Then Tim plays Spell Stutter Sprite countering the Bant Charm and fizzling the Clash effect from Broken Ambitions. Tim untaps and goes to 5 from his Bitter Blossom. He activates two Fairy Conclaves and attacks Chris for half his life total, bringing him down to 7. Chris meanwhile attacks and Tim chump blocks it with a token. Tim goes down to 4 and on his attack step, Chris plays Cryptic Command, tapping his guys and drawing a card. On Chris's upkeep though, Tim plays Mistbind Click. Chris Cryptic Commands Mistbind Click, countering the 4-4 Flying Time Walk and bouncing Tim's Fairy Conclave. Chris then attacks Tim to just 2 life. Tim goes to 1 and attacks for 4 damage, putting Chris at 3 life. 
Tim plays Mistbind Click at sorcery speed to champion his Bitter Blossom, replays his Fairy Conclave, and passes the turn. Chris simply plays Wrath of God during his turn and lets Tim die to his own Bitter Blossom on his next upkeep. In Game 3, Tim goes first and keeps a hand of Mistbind Click, Bitter Blossom, Arcane Sanctum, Reflecting Pool, Scion of Una, Thought Seize, and Mystic Gate. Chris keeps a hand of Vivid Marsh, Reflecting Pool, Cryptic Command, Mole Drifter, and two Kitchen Finks along with a Bant Charm. Tim leads with Arcane Sanctum and passes the turn. Chris plays Vivid Marsh and does the same. Tim then plays Reflecting Pool and Bitter Blossom. Chris answers with a Vivid Grove. Tim goes to 19 for a token, plays Mystic Gate, and passes. Chris plays Reflecting Pool and Kitchen Finks, going to 22. Tim plays a Scion of Una at the end of his turn. With Tim at 18 from Bitter Blossom, he attacks with Scion of Una and now a 2 2 Fairy Rogue token, bringing Chris to 19. Tim then plays Thoughtseize, going to 16. Chris shows him Cryptic Command, 2 Mole Drifter, Fire Spout, Kitchen Finks, and Bant Charm. Tim chooses the Cryptic Command. Tim then plays his other Thoughtseize, going down to 14, and takes the Bant Charm. Chris uses Fire Spout with just green mana to deal 3 to all flyers and attacks Tim to 11. Tim goes down to 10 from Bitter Blossom and passes. On Chris's upkeep, Tim plays Mistbind Click, championing the token. This resolves, and Chris plays a Vivid Grove and passes the turn. Tim goes down to 9 from Bitter Blossom and attacks Chris to 15. On Chris's upkeep, Tim plays yet another Mistbind Click, championing yet another token. Tim goes down to 8 the next turn from making the token and attacks Chris to 7 life. Chris attacks and Tim declares no blocks. Tim goes down to just 5 life. On his upkeep, Tim drops down to just 4 life. After Bitter Blossom's trigger resolves, Chris plays a cryptic command tapping Tim's creatures and drawing a card. Tim then plays his own cryptic command bouncing Kitchen Finks and drawing a card. Chris simply draws and passes the turn. Tim goes down to 3 from Bitter Blossom on his upkeep, and Chris attempts to play Cryptic Command, tapping Tim's creatures and drawing a card. Tim shows him his only card, a Spell Stutter Sprite, countering the Cryptic Command and winning Tim Furrow the tournament. I'm back. Uh, Gabriel Nassif called in poker. I mean, sick. <laughs> and uh, we replaced him with DJ Kastner, local superstar. And Phil Cave is back by popular request. And he has not yet shaved. <laughs> That's true. So Evan Irwin mailed us three more packs of magic cards to open up. And that's, I guess, what we're doing, right? What do you hope for when you open up a pack here? Um, Sigil of Distinction. What? That's I mean, the bomb? It's definitely, it's, it's one of the best cards in the, in the set, oh, yeah? and uh, it's going to make every deck. Oh. So. Soul's Fire, Vectus Silencers, Welkin Guide, Bone Splinters, Elvish Visionary, Wild Nactal, <laughs> <laughs> Grixis Panorama, yeah! Glaze Fiend, Vithian Stinger, Ooh. Rocks Charger. I like the Stinger better. Uh, I think <laughs> this guy's actually a better card. Yeah. Thunder Thresh Elder. You would. Demon's Herald, Sidroxus Spectre, and Soul's Might. All right, pack two. Dose. Cataract Creeper, Savage Hunter, Ridge Renette, Cathari Screecher, Onyx Goblet, Obelisk of Esper, God Toucher, <laughs> Gust Rider Exuberant, Resounding Wave, Magma Spray, Scavenger Drake, Sphinx's Herald, Algae Garial, Death Baron, a Swamp, and information about the Esper Tribe. The Starter Deck, Viachino Skeleton, Ethereum Sculptor, Akrasan Squire, Dreg Reaver, Sigil Blessing, Druid of the Anima, Ridge Renette, Steelclad Serpent, Excommunicate, Bane Wasp Affliction, Jungle Weaver, Blister Beetle, Obelisk of Jund, Cathartic Adept, Lightning Talons, Naya Panorama, 
Onyx Goblet, Obelisk of Esper, God Toucher, Gust Rider Exuberant, Tide Hollow Strix, Cathari Screecher, Soul's Grace, Mastodon, Wave Skimmer Avon, Elvish Visionary, Dragon Fodder, Executioner's Capsule, Carrion Thrash, Vithian Stinger, Gift of the Gargantuans, Outrider of Jess, Drum Hunter, Sprouting Thrinax, Esper Battle Mage, Metallurgeon, Woolly Thokdar, Angel's Herald, that's three heralds, Necrogenesis, <laughs> Swerve, Dawnray Archer, Lich's Mirror, Mythic Rift, yeah! <laughs> yeah, we did it! Money back. Feral Hydra, Spearbreaker Behemoth, and Rock Class Caster Platoon. Now let's go build. <laughs> we should do ready break. <laughs> ready break. Alright, uh, I guess we're talking about a few of the cards here that are uh, interesting from the sealed deck, and not just powerful ones that obviously you play like Oblivion Ring or whatever. Uh, first up, Welkin Guide. What are you guys' experience with Welkin Guide? Welkin Guide has always been a card that played a lot better than it looks. It's really good at pushing through damage, and most of the white decks tend to be aggressive. Uh, and it leaves behind a reasonable body. And DJ, what are your thoughts? Uh, Welkin Guy can certainly give you some reach, but uh, I think it's much better in draft. My only problem with the card is that it's not creature type oop. Uh, what about Dawn Ray Archer? The Dawn Ray Archer is a card I see getting passed way too often. Uh, pretty much anything with Exalted yeah, is playable. Exalted. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and this one doesn't need to attack anyway. This one's got a good ability, yeah, right? Exactly. It does its work without attacking, and it's got Exalted on top of that. Like, that's a bonus. You lose, what, one point of toughness from, from a playable card? Plus, blue doesn't exactly have a surplus of playable creatures, you know? That's true. This guy's a respectable Or, I'm sorry for the people in the forums. I guess this, this girl is a respectable girl. <laughs> <laughs> and what about Bone Splinters? It's removal, right? I think Bone Splinters has played a lot better than I thought it would because of the quantity of unearthed creatures that black tends to have. Um, unearthed with that is obviously awesome. And Absolutely. Plus, there's a number of cards that trigger off things going to the graveyard. Yes, yes. And that, that whole plays cycle. nicely with that. That whole cycle is also in the Jun shard. Mm -hmm. It also kills black creatures, which you might not notice <laughs> by a black removal spell. I personally just like seeing vulture people impaled by bones. <laughs> what about Jungle Weaver? Oh. Like, I think this whole cycle is great. Yeah, but Jungle Weaver is the, the king of, of the cycle. Everything with, with cycling is good, and the fact that this has a large body and reach, solving a problem that green tends to have, you know, since the beginning of time. This thing's sort of like a green Cloud Thresher. <laughs> no, it, no. Like... Cloud Thresher's an honorary blue card, right? <laughs> uh, the thing about Jungle Weaver, and really, the, there's also the big white one that cycles and the big red one that cycles. Having the option to cycle early is a very useful thing for a fat creature to have, because one of the biggest problems with those six and seven drop type cards is that they just sit in your hand for so much of the game. But if you have the option to cash it in for another card, I mean, that's just, that's exactly the type of card that wants to have cycling, yeah. you know? Very well designed it's card. It's extremely relevant in a four-color deck to be able to cycle your seven-drop double green creature, too. Yes. Uh, what about Lightning Talents? This is the one I see a lot of people sleeping on. For some reason, I see people playing red aggressive decks and just not even playing it. Not even picking it. Like, did they just not get the memo that, I mean, yes, Enchant Creature by Quora's, they're uh, typically not good, but this one's good? Yeah. Right. Like, there's not exactly a surplus of removal laying around, and First Strike is... Uh, with that, once the creature has that high of a power, first strike just makes the creature a very formidable combat card. Unblock. Yeah, the abyss. And sometimes you end up in these combat situations where the other person just has to com he either has to risk his entire board, like team blocking, and gets blown out if you have any instant speed trick, or he's just taking five a turn. Or, or throwing a creature under the wheels every turn yeah. and trying to race back. Right. None of those situations are good for him. Yeah, deceptively good card. Uh, is it better in sealed or draft? I think it's better in draft. Yeah, I think building the aggro strategy in draft would be a lot easier because people don't pick it early. And, uh, yeah, I've seen those going powerful. 13th. Yep. It's unreal. What about obelisk of, well, any obelisk, really? The obelisks are cards I think are a lot better in sealed than they are in draft because the format is slower and because you do have to be greedier on your colors. Um, so the round effects they provide is relevant, but they're certainly not good cards 
Uh, just compare them to dark steel ingot and you'll see. I think everyone's opinion changes. It varies on the obelisk and uh, how many numbers you should play in your sealed deck. But uh, usually you're going to want to play at least one if you're playing more than three colors. It's definitely reasonable to have the mana fixing, but it, boy does it occupy the wrong spot on the curve. And what about the panoramas? Key to sealed. <laughs> you got a common mana fixing to go around with your four color deck. It's uh, very important. We don't seem to have too many in this uh, particular sealed. How often do you play four colors in the sealed? It happens more often, but usually you're two, you're two colors focused with splash to get on to either side. side. Yeah, on either side of the charge. So if you're red green base, you'll end up with white and blue. One more card we have black. that's kind of interesting that I wanted to talk about: Gift of the Gargantuan. I see a lot of people talking about this in a lot of different places. Now, I think it has some constructed applications, especially with the loss of harmonize. I mean, it's probably the best green card drawing spell out there right now, right? I mean, it's sort of like a compulsive research. It is, and it isn't. It's not a green compulsive research? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's Because it's not reliable enough. Not at all. In Constructed, you could build your deck, though, so that you can consistently trigger it, right? But do you really want a deck that's all creatures and lands? Does that mean 30? I don't know. I don't know if that's actually that bad of a thing. I mean, a lot of the good cards these days are creatures. That's, a, that, that's true. I could very, like, I could picture some sort of a, I could picture a number of decks that use Gift of the Gargantuan. It's just... What do you have that lets you regain the tempo if your deck is all creatures and land? Birds of Paradise, Land of Wealth. It's interesting. How is it in Limited? Now, I hear a lot of people talking about how insane it is, but has it, I mean, I don't I know. Was it seemed, I played against it. If you, I haven't played with it yet, but I've played against it a number of times, and I don't know. It hasn't really knocked my socks off. Yeah, I was underwhelmed as well. It, it missed more often, and sometimes I'd play it because I needed, I needed something, and I'd pass right by my removal spell that I really... Wanted. And obviously, putting it to the bottom isn't the issue. It's the fact that I couldn't draw that card off of it ever. Another question that I thought was kind of interesting was the Rocks Charger and the Vithian Stinger. The reason I bring this up is because uh, I'm curious on what you guys, which one you guys think is better. The 4-4 the four, four Trampler for 4. The 3-3 three, three Trampler with Exalted for 4? Oh, uh, yes, the same thing. Yeah, and what about you? Um, definitely the Charger. I think Pingers are better in draft also, but the Charger is just clearly a more powerful card in my opinion. This Charger, like, seems like you can help rip open a game, right? Like, everything with Exalted is good, and this guy's actually just a good card even without the Exalted. Yeah. Exactly. Alright, th these are the uh, magic cards that we opened. The thing is, I think we should take the unplayables out. Okay. Okay. And now the unplayables are gone. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing how editing works. <laughs> Phil, you're killing it. All right. First of all, I think we should go ahead and edit white out of here. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure white's it's gone. It was our way to start. Imagine. Is it hockey season? Yeah. Yeah. All right, then we better not play Sigil Bless. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Now, which of our colors is compelling? I mean, obviously we have a lot of green cards. Actually, we have a lot of good green cards. Too. I think the green cards are very compelling. Like, that's probably We've the place to start. Room. We got uh, the youngest drum hunter. What do you think, though? <laughs> I think he's great. He draws cards, he accelerates your mana out to your big fatties. He's exactly the type of card this deck wants. Wild the Coddle. Not sure if we're playing white, but I mean, we have one uh, panorama. I guess we could play one planes. Yeah. Like, just to give you a board presence early, he's probably good enough. One drafts aren't the best, but when it's East Mar or Train Armor Dome. I heard a number of people saying the Grizzly Bear is not that good in this format. So you like the Crocodile better than the uh, the Flyer? I, yes, I do. I think Algae Gary is a much better card, even though they're both quite good. Uh, Algae Gariel just sits out, sits on the table. He's a little undersized for a four drop, but usually you can hold the ground with your other monsters. The one a one is a little undersized for a four <laughs> drop. A little bit, a little bit. But a couple trades, maybe you play a bone splinters, and suddenly Algae Gariel's looking pretty big. Yeah, the the drink's pretty good, but sometimes I don't know. Sometimes he's too fragile. I don't know about him off the splash, because it looks like we're definitely base red green. I agree. How good is Karen Thresh? Looks Quite. great. Right? Yeah, it's, it is great, especially if you have two. Uh, obviously, we only have one in this pool, but even with just one, it's a 4-4 four, four for five, which is reasonable size, reasonable cost. And when it dies, I mean, they can't effectively block it. It's going to get you back a card, and often it's going to be a really good card. It's kind of nice that we have these cyclers that we can cycle early to ensure that we have a creature in our graveyard. Yeah, and then by the time we get it back with the Carrion Thrash, it's right about time to start dropping the bombs. Yeah. I don't want to play a lot of the two drops, and uh, this guy cycles, but then gives you value. And if you just get a chump block out of it, often it's worth it because there's a lot of you know big creatures to jump block. But we have other things like Bone Splinters and Devour. And... All right, I like this guy a lot better than the Obelisk. I mean, two is such a better place on the curve for mana acceleration. 
They have cycling. How many fat creatures can you really play? If they were all jungle weavers, I would play a lot. As far as limited goes, how good is it? I think it's perfect in this deck. We've got so much boom boom. And I mean, that's pretty much good for five or six damage, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's what I'm thinking. Even if it's only two or three, it's uh, very reasonable removal spells in an instant. In this deck, it's like one of our best cards. It's a finisher. It's a blaze. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's a legitimate finisher. Is Executioner's Capsule as good as uh, people think it is? I don't, I don't think we're utilizing it the best way possible, but I think it's still one of our better removal spells, if not the best. Yeah, we're not going to have enough black to play it as a to top deck it as a removal spell, but it's fine to just put it out there as a suspended one. Get, yeah, exactly. Eventually get your terror. Devour three, huh? How how much do you push all in? Like how many ways are there? How many like common ways are there to deal with a seven seven? Well, if I'm stacking an Elish Visionary, I'm probably going to go as far as possible, or with the <laughs> Dragon Fighter. Yeah, we're a couple sprouting three next tokens. We got lots of ways in the deck to power that guy up. The question is, how easy is he to deal with? The oh, answer well, is not soul fire. Wow, the bounce spells that are pretty instant fire. too. There's a lot of three damage removal spells in this format, so the power three, going to a four four, no matter how many guys you say, as long as it's more than one, is pretty relevant. All right, here's 30 of our playable spells that uh, are on color enough to consider. We're probably gonna take seven, maybe eight of these bad boys out. All right, these are the cards we cut. Uh, first of all, the most interesting two are the Wild Mikado and the, uh, the Wooly Thoctor. I think that we've got enough of a late game plan that uh, it's worth taking out the white and uh, just sticking with mana consistency. The uh, Nakato, uh, are we just being crazy? I mean, that guy's a 2 2 for one. The, the Nakato? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I can see how Elvish Visionary would further our plan a little bit more. It just seems like all we're trying to do is live until we can start. Dropping crawl worms, right? Exactly. Now, I could be totally wrong about this format. I mean, I don't actually know for sure if, uh, like, it might just be crazy to cut a wild McConnell when he's a 2 2, but he just doesn't seem to further what we're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, as far as the thought there, I mean, the only thing that really recommends him, it's not his 5 4 body, it's his 3 casting cost. Sure. If, we, if we can't hit that reliably on turn 3, which I don't think we can without weakening our other elements that are more powerful. I, I don't think he really is any better than a 5 mana, 5 4, which wouldn't be tremendously exciting, although playable. All right, this is what we ended up with. Our two drops are Elvish Visionaries and Druid Anima. And as well as three cycling cards. Yeah, several cycling cards. So we have a lot of live action on two. The uh, the whole game we're playing early is just trying to survive long enough to start dropping Crawl Worms. Uh, we got some removal spells, but they're not really going to be played early. I mean, it's possible we'll Magma Spray early, but. Then we have uh, at the three spot, we have a couple of pingers. They're not the most exciting in this format, but they're still solid. I mean, they're always good. And um, I love the unearth ability on this guy. Uh, Coming back for a second round is awesome. We just and I love killing the Iguanar. We know? decided to play Gift of the Gargantuan with 17 creatures. Absolutely. Yeah. Gift of the Gargantuan one. Definitely respectful when you got 17 creatures and 17 land. Does it get a whole lot better? All right, at the four spot, Drum Hunter is very exciting to me, and the Rocks Charger, obviously. I mean, I think Rocks Charger just fits so well with the idea of us sending in a Crawl Worm every turn that they just cannot deal with. Yeah. We have so many big monsters. Like, that's a lot of people that's have bombs. Right. What we have is we have Mastodon, Carrion Thrash, Feral Hydra, two Ridge Ranrets, a Spear Back Breaker Behemoth, and a Jungle Weaver. So, I mean, we literally, if we just live long enough to hit six or seven mana. Five, 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 six, six more. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's our plan, you know? We're down to 23 spells, so we can play 17 land, and... Uh, Alright guys, while the cattle might not be entirely thematic, but it's too powerful to not play. Besides, you're probably playing too much mana anyway. And it's kitty. Ah, that's right! <laughs> Put him in! Actually, we, what we just talked about is uh, looking at it with two Elvish Visionaries, uh, three sources of mana, uh, three mana accelerators, and a gift of the Gargantuan, and three cycling cards. Uh, I think it's probably fair to drop down to 16 land, despite the fact that we're ramping all the way to 7. Uh, got managed for both games and lost in round 1. See you next week.
I always like the fatties.